When the North Korean ship Mangyong Bong 92 touched the coastlines of South Korea in 2018, it was the first time that a North Korean vessel had legally entered its neighbor's territory in over 16 years. The ship was carrying performers that were to participate in the Winter Olympics. Protests were quick to follow. It wasn't just because the vessel had come from a violent enemy state. It was the name of the ship itself that was bound to create a stir in the minds of some South Korean nationals. Murder, spying, kidnapping, drug trade, counterfeit currency, terrorism, attempts of political assassination, this ship finds itself at the center of almost every crime the DPRK has committed in the region. It was North Korea's primary asset in crime, a true spy ship, shrouded in mystery and notoriety for most of its life. When North Korea tried to repaint its controversial past by turning it into a luxurious cruise ship, it turned out to be a colossal failure, earning itself the nickname of the least luxurious cruise ship in the world by many. This video is about an infamous spy ship and a dark chapter in the Japan-North Korea relationship that made this ship invincible in Japanese waters. The story begins not from the sea, but from Japan. In colonial times, more than 2 million Koreans had migrated from the Korean peninsula to Japan under conditions that involved varying degrees of freedom and coercion. Some had fled the war, while others were brought as slaves of Japanese occupation. The vast majority, more than 95%, came from the southern half of the Korean peninsula. When the war was over, the majority repatriated to the south. What remained was about 600,000 Koreans who constituted Japan's largest ethnic minority. Called Zionichi Koreans, they often lived in deep poverty and uncertain social and legal status. Despite having lived in Japan for many decades, their nationality was uncertain. They faced ethnic discrimination, limited educational and job opportunities, and a lack of access to welfare. Things took a turn in 1958 when the North Korean leader Kim Il-sung announced a program to repatriate Zionichi Koreans to North Korea. The DPRK announced that it would wholeheartedly accept those who would want to move. Following this announcement, pro-North Korea organizations in Japan launched a widespread propaganda campaign to portray North Korea as a socialist paradise on Earth, a rapidly developing economy that was destined to be the most prosperous in the region, and hence Zionichi Koreans should return for a bright future that was waiting for them at home. For discriminated and neglected Korean minorities, this sounded like a moment to cherish. They could finally move to a country where they would not be treated like a second-class citizen. Soon enough, Japan declared its willingness to support this program, which they called a, quote, humanitarian project. Unclassified reports later revealed that the Japanese government had been persuading the North Korean government for many years to start such a scheme. They had already drawn up a secret draft plan for a mass exodus of deprived Korean minorities who were seen as criminals, a burden on welfare schemes, and unfit for the Japanese society. In return, North Korea expected better relationships with Japan, open trade routes, and lesser restrictions since it desperately wanted to reduce its dependency on the Soviet Union. Propaganda and conspiracy successfully convinced thousands of unsuspecting Zionichi Koreans, and they got ready to move to North Korea with their families, many of whom were Japanese citizens. This mass migration of people from the free world to a dictatorial communist regime of North Korea was sure to evoke opposition from the Republic of South Korea and the US, so the Japanese government looped in the Japanese Red Cross to ensure a confirmation of free will from migrants. On the grounds, this was for the most part a facade to give this program credibility in the eyes of the world. The migrants had little to no real understanding of what they were getting themselves into. The program kicked off with ships provided by the Soviet Union. In just two years, from 1960 through 1961, more than 70,000 Korean people left Japan and moved to North Korea in the hopes of a better life. 
On their arrival in North Korea, migrants were given free accommodations for a month, where they received political education and where they were dispersed around the country irrespective of their personal wishes. Many were shocked to discover the poverty of the country to which they had come. A North Korean official who later defected to South Korea said, and quote, It is painful to witness the disillusionment of the returnees. It is accompanied by rage and words of insult towards the Red Cross and towards the humanitarianism of which it always speaks, and which does nothing but send them down the slope of a miserable country and a miserable situation. Sadly, there was no turning back. The DPRK would later brand these returnees as unreliable citizens or even worse, spies. They would be sent to do hard labor in remote and improvised villages, concentration camps, or be incarcerated. Some would try to escape, and few would succeed. When word came back of difficult conditions in the north, the popularity of repatriation dropped sharply, though the trickle of returnees to the north continued as late as 1984. A total of about 90,000 people migrated, including 6,000 Japanese citizens who were married to Zainichi Koreans. There's a documentary film called Dear Pyongyang, which is about a pro-North father who sends his three sons from Japan to North Korea under the repatriation scheme, leaving their only sister in Japan. While the sister lived a fairly good life, her brothers struggled for survival and got increasingly dependent on care packages and money sent by their parents. The father would later regret his decision for breaking up their family. Lives destroyed, families divided and dispersed between two countries, the repatriation project forged a deep and enduring social link between Japan and North Korea. This led to a new era in the relationship between the two countries, which would be very difficult for Japan to break from in the following decades. The repatriation project had created a need for a passenger direct sea link between the two countries, and in the 1970s, Japanese organizations helped North Korea build their first famous cargo passenger ship, the Mangyongbong, to replace the Soviet ones. With a carrying capacity of 200 passengers and thousands of tons of cargo, Mangyongbong established a link between Japan's port of Niigata and the coastal North Korean city of Wonsan. Passengers were mostly migrants, relatives of migrants, and students of Chongryan schools on orchestrated study trips to North Korea. Cargo shipped from Japan was typically electronics, medical devices, and foreign-made manufactured goods as well as care packages and cash help for relatives in North Korea. For about a decade, Japanese and North Korean citizens enjoyed a heyday of freedom and travel, and the DPRK continued to keep on good terms with the government in Tokyo. However, as the 80s dawned, relations began to sour. North Korea's reputation was quickly becoming pear-shaped, and Japan's policymakers did not follow many of the DPRK's government demands. North Korea provided a safe haven to a powerful Japanese terrorist group, the Japanese Red Army, and committed a plethora of crimes against their neighbor South Korea, all while slandering Japan in propaganda. The relationship between North Korea and Japan continued to rock back and forth, but evidently didn't become too sour as Japan feared the reaction of its volatile neighbor and the ending relations could be seen as harassing its 600,000 strong Korean minorities who had even stronger ties with North Korea after mass repatriation. Meanwhile, Mangyongbong was replaced by its successor, Mangyongbong 92, in the year 1992. The Japan-based Korean organization made a 4 billion yen donation for Kim Il-sung's birthday to help build it. North Korea's bond with Japan lasted for another decade until 2002, when it all came crashing down. In 2002, the government of North Korea finally admitted to abducting several Japanese nationals who had gone missing throughout the 1970s and 80s. Investigations later revealed that North Korea would steal their identities and force them into the task of teaching the Japanese language and culture at North Korean spy schools. Some were abducted because they happened to witness the activities of North Korean agents in Japan. 
with North Korea only admitting to abducting 13 citizens when there were probably hundreds of kidnappings, public outrage was quick to ensue. This admission threw glaring suspicion on the first Mangyongbong, with people becoming extremely distrustful of the ship and suggesting that it had been involved in the kidnappings since it was the only direct link between the two nations. Mangyongbong 92, being the successor of the older ship, was suspected of continuing these nefarious acts for North Korea. While Japanese ministers thought over the rising demand for banning the ship, even more accusations began to pile up against it. For much of its life, the vessel had been out of range and difficult to trace or identify, making it violently suspicious, especially given the increasing volumes of evidence for the ship's eyebrow-raising activities in smuggling illegal drugs such as amphetamines and counterfeit cash between North Korea and Japan. Sorely aware of their lack of electronic hardware necessary for their military equipment, North Korea was suspected in having launched a covert operation into Japan to smuggle electronic devices and technological know-how that may be adapted for unpeaceful purposes. Seemingly innocent tourists aboard the MGB-92 would trawl shopping malls in Tokyo looking for the latest technology that could be bought, including game consoles and camera lenses, which were then openly carried out of the country to the communist regime. These components have been identified in North Korean missiles and other military weapons. A crackdown on North Korean spy networks in Japan in 2003 revealed that Mangyongbong had been docking at the Japanese port of Niigata up to 30 times a year to relay instructions to North Korean agents and their handlers in the country. Additionally, Japanese authorities made public their concerns that this North Korean ship may have delivered orders for the attempted assassination of South Korean President Park Chung-hee in 1971. Several arrests made under the spy charges revealed the role played by the ship in conveying illicit secret messages between Pyongyang and Tokyo. While the demand to ban the ship from Japanese waters was raised again, Japan reacted by tightening the search and surveillance measures for the ship to an unprecedented level. With Japan prepared to do the nation's largest customs inspection, MGB-92 got increasingly hesitant to arrive at Japanese ports. In 2003, the ship made only one trip to Japan compared to 23 trips the previous year. The straw that finally broke the camel's back came about in 2006 when North Korea tested nuclear weapons and subsequently launched seven long-range missiles, all of which landed in the Sea of Japan. This sparked a nuclear controversy, eventually leading to Japan banning all North Korean ships from trespassing in its waters. Temporary at first, the ban became permanent after six months, putting an end to the MGB-92's legal voyages to Japan. The banning of MGB-92 ended trade with Japan, and with that, smuggling and other illegal activities took a hit. The ship could no longer bring cash help from Japan to help with North Korea's desperate poverty. A financially struggling North Korea turned to tourism to generate the much-needed cash, the one industry exempted from international sanctions imposed upon the regime. In a radical move, it was decided that MGB-92 would be refurbished into the country's first cruise ship to help tourism. They fitted out the four-decade-old ship with whatever they could find, which turned out to be very little, and made it ready for its maiden voyage in just six months. The cruise line started out from the impoverished, run-down Korean city of Rasan and followed along the east coast to reach Mount Kumgong, a scenic resort near the South Korean border. One-way journey took about 21 hours, which was part of the widely advertised five-day-long international cruise trip. However, the experiences of the tourists were anything but that. At first, the ferry ship turned cruise ship was in a state of despair with rusty portholes and musty interiors. The water on board was extremely unreliable and when available, it was a grimy brown soup that trickled out of outdated taps. 
The best of the cabins were equipped with bunk beds, while many passengers had to make do with a mattress on the floor. Food options were limited and just as unreliable as the water. Fruit, noodles, and dried fish served cafeteria-style in rooms good for nothing except for questionable levels of sanitation. For entertainment, there was karaoke in the main hall. The tour operators would sing while the waitresses danced. Phones and laptops, uh, all electronics, were not allowed on the cruise and were confiscated as soon as tourists entered the country. Travelers were thoroughly checked and rechecked numerous times throughout the journey to avoid spying. Almost all international travelers on the cruise were Chinese nationals who could compromise on security, hygiene, and services to see the odd corners of the odd country of North Korea. For everyone else, the MGB-92 cruise ship was a poor deal. It lacked good facilities, even any facilities at all, and offered meager services at best, while the operators still felt the need to charge about $500 from each passenger who braved the journey. Eventually, and unsurprisingly, the cruise ship career of Mangyongbong-92 eventually screeched to a halt. The DPRK's attempts to repair the vessel's reputation by converting it into a luxury cruise ship had fallen on its face, and the stories of the horrible conditions inside the ship were all over the internet. In 2013, the tour operators rented a newer, nicer boat from Singapore to operate on the cruise route. The Royal Starship made a few trips in the region hoping that the North Korean government would allow non-Chinese foreigners to board the cruise, but that obviously didn't happen. Lack of profitable customers, the DPRK's sanctions, demands, and a plethora of other reasons eventually ended the experiment of a cruise line in the country. Meanwhile, the MGB-92 sat idle at a regime port, hoping for Japan to lift restrictions on trade and travel while occasionally roaming the waters up to its shady business in the water of East Asia. An incident in 2018 involved the stranding of North Korea's infamous spy ship near Vladivostok, Russia, for over a week while 30 crew members were subjugated to freezing temperatures of negative 20 degrees without any fuel and far from ample supplies. The port authorities refused to allow the mooring of the ship in suspicion that it was harboring illegal cargo and the crew on board wasn't ready for inspection of the ship. It wasn't until they raised the distress alarm that emergency help could be sent from the port. Later that year, MGB-92 carried a 150-person delegation of orchestra and musicians to South Korea to perform during the Winter Olympics. Despite the protests, the ban on North Korean vessels was temporarily lifted to allow the ship to enter the South Korean border for the first time in 16 years. The ship hasn't appeared in the public spotlight since then. The current whereabouts of the ship is unknown. With the current shortage of cargo ships North Korea has been facing, it's logical to assume that MGB-92 is out there in the sea, perhaps under a different name, indulged in some other illegal activity for its country. <laughs>